Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bill Charman, and it's my honour to be your MC this afternoon as we celebrate and recognise the extraordinary life of our friend, colleague, and mentor, John Ware OAM. I begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land on which this campus stands, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Now this college, this faculty, Monash University, this campus, our profession and indeed this hall, which is considered the home of pharmacy in Victoria, meant so much to John Ware. And it's therefore so appropriate that we're able to join together today to celebrate his life right here in Cossa Hall. Today's event has been planned by the faculty in conjunction with Nariel, and I'm told we're following COVID policy and procedures of the university, and we're grateful for your compliance. Although if we're at the MCG, we would have had a slightly larger group. I extend a special welcome to Nariel, to John's sister Marnie, and to the members of the broader Ware family, including his son David and partner Ruth, son Andrew and wife Diane, and grandson Alexander and partner Bronte. To other guests, family and friends, faculty, staff and students, members of PSA and other professional pharmacy organisations, those who have travelled from around Victoria and interstate, and to those attending through the live streaming platform, on behalf of Nariel and the Ware family, we thank you for your presence today, your goodwill and your support. I have received apologies today for an inability to attend from John and Lynn Coppock and Robert and Pat Scanlon. It was not so long ago that many of us were here together in this very hall to launch the John and Nariel Ware Fellowship in Pharmacy Education and Leadership. And at that event, we unveiled this beautiful portrait that we have up here on the stage, a beautiful portrait of John and Nariel. And normally, and we did take it from the stage after that event a couple of years ago, that portrait normally hangs in pride of place up here on the wall in Cossa Hall. My task at the moment is to provide you with a brief description of aspects of John's life. And then Professor Arthur Christopoulos, our faculty dean, will speak about John's seminal contributions to pharmacy and the college, Monash University and FIP, after which Mel Blashford will provide some personal and professional reflections and observations of his good friend. This will be followed by a short video montage of footage we have of John, after which we can join together for afternoon tea to celebrate John's life and remember and share stories of which there are many and to share the goodwill in a way in which I know would make John immensely proud. John Alexander Ware was born on the 9th of April in 1928 and today therefore would have been his 93rd birthday. The Ware family lived in Auburn Road, Hawthorne. John first attended Auburn Primary School, and then his father, who was a relieving staff member at the Commercial Bank of Australia, was transferred with his family to Haywood in country Victoria. John first attended Haywood Primary School, and for secondary school, went some distance to Portland High School, requiring a round trip on a rickety bus each day. After that time in Haywood, the Ware family moved back to Collingwood during the war years. And it was during that time that John attended Northcote High School. Having come back to Melbourne, I'm told, Saturdays were invariably spent at the VFL watching a team that began with H called Hawthorne. John was a high achieving student. He had many options to further his studies after high school including studying law at the University of Melbourne. However, John had worked at Maxwell's Pharmacy in Paran, and it was this positive experience that led him to choose pharmacy as what would then become his future profession. I know from Marnie that Maxwell's Pharmacy was close to her favourite cake shop. 
and that John would regularly bring her home treats when he'd been working there. And as we know, John went on to complete his pharmacy training here at the Victorian College of Pharmacy, from which he graduated in 1950, 70 years ago. After completing his studies, his apprenticeship and his time at the college, John travelled to England and worked in the UK for a number of years. Upon returning to Australia, he embarked on a career in community pharmacy. And it was while working as a locum in Seymour that he then decided to settle in that area. After which, for the next 40 years, John and his pharmacy would provide healthcare services to the broader Seymour community. John served that local community through his pharmacy, through his pivotal role in establishing the local Karingal Elderly Citizens Hospital, and through his contributions to the Seymour Memorial Hospital, for which he was recognised through being made a life governor. John also, in the, in the Seymour area, had a long-standing relationship with the Pakapunyal Army Base, and especially the Armoured Regiment. For a time when John's sons were attending high school here in Melbourne, the family moved back to Melbourne and John operated and had a second pharmacy in Hawthorne Road, Caulfield, while still maintaining the pharmacy in Seymour. Family was very much a hallmark of his life through his extended family, through his care for family, and through the special relationships that he had with his grandchildren. Now, most of us here in the room today know John through the lens of pharmacy. But outside of pharmacy, he was an extremely well-rounded, active and interesting person with interests including cricket, fishing, sailing, skiing, dinghy yacht racing, slightly competitive opportunity for him. I didn't know this one, local amateur theatre, rally car navigation, and even a foray into a small business flying crayfish from the Bass Strait, Bass Strait Islands to, the Mel to market in Melbourne in a post-World War II aircraft. And of course, there was olive oil, where John and Nariel planted and nurtured their olive grove. And it was through that that the Mans Hill brand of olive oil has been recognised with numerous prizes through the Royal Melbourne Show. John was highly intelligent. He was generous. He was interested in others. He was someone who could, and most significantly did make a difference. He enjoyed the company of people of all ages, of people from all walks of life, and of people from all nationalities. John was fun to be with and fun to be around. So now to describe and reflect on some of John's professional achievements through his engagement with the college, Monash University and FIP, I now welcome the faculty dean to the podium, Arthur Christopoulos. Thank you, Bill. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored and I'm privileged to be here today representing our faculty and sharing some reflections of our dear friend, our mentor, our long-term champion of the pharmacy profession, John Alexander Ware, OAM. As Bill indicated, John was a born leader. He was ambitious, he was caring, and he was extraordinarily generous. Through his thoughts and through his deeds, he genuinely wanted to make the world a better place, and I believe that he did. As you heard from Bill, John graduated from the Victorian College of Pharmacy, the mighty VCP, in 1950, and practised as a community pharmacist until 1995. Throughout his long distinguished career, he was deeply involved with the leadership of the profession. Through numerous organisations within Australia, at the Victorian College of Pharmacy itself, and globally through his work with the International Pharmaceutical Federation, also known as FIP, as well as the World Health Organization. John's professional achievements are broad in scope and they're daunting in number. As I have said in the past, John was a giant in our field. It's difficult actually to identify another peer in terms of the range of John's activities, achievements or impact of his work on our profession 
over the past seven years. Some important representative examples of John Ware's professional roles and contributions include that he was counsellor of the Victorian branch of the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia for 26 years, and he served as president from 1984 to 1987. At a national level, John was a counsellor and then vice president of the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia, and he served as its national president between 1989 and 1991. John had a vision for professional and community pharmacy that was well ahead of its time. He was a passionate advocate for continuing education and for improving professional practice through workforce competency standards. Indeed, my earliest personal memories of John were during my time as a PhD student here at the college, where he was the first to impress upon me the importance of giving back to the profession through leveraging my research to advance uh, practice in any way that I could. And in fact, one of the mantras of John's that I recollect even to, till recently, he was always saying, uh, you know, research informing practice, research should be informing practice. In his particular instance, he was uh, uh, actively encouraging me, no twisting of arms required in any way, to deliver continuing professional education lectures to pharmacists in metropolitan and especially in rural regions. John's love and his advocacy for rural pharmacy in particular are well known. More recently, John had proved an invaluable mentor and guide together with Peter Cook and John Coppock through their roles on our faculty's foundation board as I've been navigating my new role as Dean. And as Nariel recently learned, John and I shared two other common passions, love of olives and love of the mighty hawks. John was also a visionary and an early advocate for collaborative care through patient-centered partnerships between pharmacists, medical doctors, and nurses. He was involved with examining councils, the Australian College of Pharmacy Practice, the National Asthma Council of Australia, and the National Prescribing Service. As to the VCP, well, that truly had a special place in John's life. Uh, as I mentioned and Bill did as well earlier, he graduated in 1950 from here, and in 1982, he was a member of the college's governing council for 22 years being its president from 1988 until 1994. And let me say, our faculty is so fortunate to have had John Ware as president of the council at that time, as it coincided with the Dawkins era of tumultuous reforms in Australia's higher education section. Now, many of you will remember what I'm talking about. Some of the younger people here and out there in streaming land may not. I was a student here at the time when all this was happening. When I started, Tom Watson was Dean, and we were called the Victorian College of Pharmacy. When I finished, Colin Chapman was Dean, and we were called the Victorian College of Pharmacy, Monash University. The college was destined to amalgamate with the University of Melbourne. Although books and scholarly articles have been written on the subject, I would like to briefly summarize John's critical role in all of this. The planned amalgamation with Melbourne was definitely heading in the wrong direction. And John foresaw that such an amalgamation would risk the future standing and the identity of the college, and thus its opportunity to lead pharmaceutical education, research, and professional practice. It was John's vision and his dogged determination, supported by Tom Watson, who was the Dean, as I said, during this period, to instead explore amalgamation with Monash University. In uh, 2018, a fascinating article on the whole amalgamation saga was published by the historian Andre Brett in the journal um, History of Education. I don't know if you haven't seen that, I strongly recommend it. It's a great read. And I've chosen a specific passage from the article that I'd like to share with you. Ware recalls the pivotal moment which took place after meeting with Pennington, David Pennington, of course, being the vice chancellor of Unimelb at the time. He turned to Watson, this is John, while passing through a university gate onto Royal Parade. Tom, I've had this, he remarked. Watson, who concurred, asked Ware what he was going to do. I'm going to make a phone call, he replied, because I think we should have a talk to Monash. That's John Ware. The decision was controversial. It was bold. It was certainly unexpected by many and not without risk, but how right he was. Fast forward to today, and based on the QS World University Rankings Index, our faculty is number two in the world in the disciplines of pharmacy and pharmacology, 
but actually number one in the world as the actual pharmacy program. Oxford Uni does not have a pharmacy school and have been so for the past four years. Nariel, I know that you and John have always been very proud of our faculty's achievements as are our staff and students, our alumni and the university. And as many of you are aware and Bill has mentioned, John and Nariel made the largest ever philanthropic gift to pharmacy education in Australia when they established the John and Nariel Ware Fellowship in Pharmacy Education and Leadership. I'm delighted that Morgan, recipient of the fellowship, Dr. Kaylee Lyons is with us and that this fellowship program, I believe, will become enshrined as a signature stepping stone for pharmacy educators and leaders in the future. After leaving community pharmacy in 1995, John only got busier in his indomitable way by increasing his engagement with the International Pharmaceutical Federation, with the FIP, including 11 years as president of the Western Pacific Pharmaceutical Forum of FIP. Through this role, he had impact on medicines, manufacturing and professional pharmacy services in China, the Philippines, Japan, Korea and Thailand. John was also a director and then chair of the FIP Foundation for Education and Research for many years. I know that he thoroughly enjoyed this work and engaging with members of the Foundation Board, colleagues from FIP around the world and with staff and bureau members at the FIP headquarters at The Hague. Nariel, as always, supported John in all of his FIP activities, especially those of the Western Pacific Pharmaceutical Forum, and she always attended the annual meeting uh, with John. I have to say, I was a recently, uh, a relatively, I should say, latecomer to the, to the FIP family and the FIP party, and I have to say, uh, one of the things that awed me, uh, not, uh, over and above the receptions, the food and all the festivities, the reality was, the esteem, the regard and the awe that the global pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences family held for John and for Nariel, uh, like pharmacy royalty. I recently received the following correspondence from Professor Carmen Pena, uh, honorary president of the FRP, and she asked me to share this with you today. So this is from Carmen. Dear John, I had the privilege of meeting you and your dear Nariel many years ago in our worldwide house, the FIP. John, you have been one of the solid pillars that have allowed us to realize the great transformation of our Federation in recent years. You have been and always will be a model of professionalism, honesty, fraternity, loyalty and friendship. Your great knowledge of both pharmacy with a capital P and of entrepreneurship have allowed those of us who admire you and were fortunate to have shared work with you to benefit from the great legacy you have left us. Dear friend, dear colleague, both you and Nariel, your wife, your advisor, your life partner, from me and Antonia, my husband, you will always be present in our hearts. So thank you, Carmen. John's professional achievements have not surprisingly been widely recognised. For example, he received fellowships from the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia, the Australian College of Pharmacy Practice, the Australian Institute of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain, and of course the FIP. Of particular note, John received the Order of Australia Medal in 2002 for his services to pharmacy, another Distinguished Service Award from the FIP in 2014, and most recently, he was awarded the 2020 Victorian Pharmacist Lifetime Achievement Award. Another hallmark of John's inclusive nature is how much he enjoyed the company of people of all ages. And Bill alluded to that quite nicely and quite eloquently. All walks of life, all nationalities. He was comfortable and effective in different forums and at different tables. And both Bill and Nari will know where I'm going with this. Be they meeting room tables, negotiating tables, boardroom tables, government committee tables, the dinner table, and of course, one of his and Nariel's favorite, the captain's table. It is hard to imagine John's character, legacy and impact ever being matched. He was absolutely one of a kind. And behind his professional profile, he has always been one of the most generous, caring and supportive individuals that I've ever met. A truly empathetic person of the highest integrity and character. John was a force of nature. I know that I'm not alone in saying that we miss him but that we will always be better people for knowing him. John, 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 
you are all class and all heart, and you and Nariel will forever remain beloved and cherished members of our faculty's history and our pharmacy family. And on that note, Nariel, I'm looking forward to continuing our new tradition of regular lunches at the Dean's table. I'm certain that John would approve, especially knowing that you'll be keeping a close eye on our faculty. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Mel Blashett. Mel is such a well-known person in pharmacy in Victoria, has held so many senior and leadership roles, and has worked with John and been a fellow traveller in so many different ways. So, Mel, we look forward to your reflections, both professional and personal. Thanks, Bill. Well, good afternoon. It's like it's almost like afternoon to tell you at the nursing home looking out on everybody today. <laughs> but we're all growing old very gracefully and, it, and it's just uh, wonderful to be here uh, to honour uh, the life of John. Um, it's been some time in coming, as you know, because the uh, restrictions with COVID meant that there was very few people able to come to John's funeral in uh, early January and the other initial uh, talk that was to, hit, to be done here in March was also cancelled because of COVID. So how lucky are we to be here today? Hopefully with uh, no COVID around, no masks and celebrating uh, John's life on his birthday. The other thing that COVID uh, did last year in December was to make it impossible for the annual dinner uh, that was held or lunch that was held at Seymour at uh, John and Ariel's house for the last 28 years. And uh, this would have been the, the 29th Mario, Mario? Yeah. And uh, so Margaret and I resolved, we said, we must have had, I sort of had a kind of a premonition about things looking back on it. And I said to Margaret, we can't let um, this anniversary go by. And so we arranged to have uh, a small dinner at our house in Melbourne as a consolation prize for not being able to gather every year as we had. And so I asked John who, um, who we'd like to have just in a small group because uh, that was the way he wished it. And we were able to have um, uh, Alistair and, uh, was there and also uh, Maureen Naismith, who was the, many of you will know, was the, uh, the widow of uh, Neil Naismith. And that was a fantastic day. John, John uh, was in a bit of pain with uh, uh, some sort of back issue at the time, but we had a very pleasant day. And looking back on it now, uh, that was the last time that, that we saw John because he died quite soon after that on the 27th of December. So there were some very special lunches there, which I'll talk about in later. In reflecting it as uh, an old friend, um, and I consulted with John Kopoff, who was also uh, one of his uh, close friends about what I should be saying about him as a friend today. And I'm taken back to where Margaret and I uh, met with John in Madrid at the FIP conference in 1980. And those of you who know John, as many of you do, is that he was absolutely obsessed about pharmacy and if he could talk about pharmacy, he would. And he spent a fair bit of time at, at the conference, which we were just there as attendees, um, so telling me all the things that were wrong with pharmacy. And eventually, uh, after a, a few cocktails, I said, John, why don't you put your money where your mouth is and get out and do something about it? Well, never did I think for a minute that he would take up the challenge, but he did. <laughs> Boy, did he take up the challenge. 
Uh, he came back, he uh, nominated for the council, uh, the PSA here, and the best was history. He was off and running, he was the, the Victorian um, the president, and then on through to the national president, as, uh, as Bill had mentioned. He was unstoppable. There was absolutely no, he was like a man driven. It was incredible to see. And, you know, all the, the his career that he did in FIP and everything where he was, uh, he was there for 10 years and he was really responsible for setting up the Western Pacific region, uh, the forum that, that, that that has continued on to this day. The other thing to uh, uh, Arthur mentioned about the uh, his uh, pivotal role um, with um, securing uh, the uh, amalgamation with Monash, and it, it, I think of all the achievements that he did, that one to me stands out as absolutely the best one. And I know through people I've spoken to since that David Pennington said that was the biggest mistake of his life, letting, letting pharmacy go because he was going to, it was going to be a subsection of medicine and it would have been a disaster. So good on you, John. Um, we've had mention of his time in pharmacy and how he, his involvement with the community um, in his pharmacy at Seymour and uh, his work with the, the nursing home and, and the, uh, the hospital in Seymour. But he, he's still remembered in, in Seymour and Marnie, Marnie's here somewhere. Hello, Mami, John's sister, that he was very well regarded. He was the pharmacist that you went to if you had issues uh, as a community pharmacy in, uh, in Seymour. So he was really, truly involved in his local community. Now, we, we come to the part where, where we, he uh, meets Nariel, because Nariel started at the, at the, the college here in 1979 and uh, so when John would have come on the scene he uh, he would have seen Nariel on, on a, a monthly basis uh, probably more than monthly with uh, committee meetings and uh, and council meetings and in those days the, the role of the registrar of the board and the, and the branch director of the uh, society was held by Alistair Lloyd, who we all know one of the finest administrators that we've ever had. And that's another story that I managed to entice him out of his pharmacy in Geelong and get him to take the job, for which I think was the most useful thing I did when I was president. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the thing that was amazing about it is that John must have been a bit of a dark horse about it because Alistair declares that he didn't have any, any idea what was going on with uh, this budding romance that was happening under his, under his watch. But at any rate, there was a happy ending to it because eventually um, they were married in December 1991 at the uh, Shadow to Bilkers, or no? Mitchelton. Mitchelton. Mitchell. I knew it was one of the, those up there with it. Um, and that was the start of our long, uh, every year having the, the reunion up at, uh, at, in December at uh, Seymour to commemorate that day. And boy, what a function that was over the years. We could all tell stories and I know there's lots of you here today who have uh, shared that. Uh, pharmacist friends from uh, all over pharmacy in Victoria, in the state, many people from the Pharmacy Guild uh, that are no longer with us, uh, many, many people who enjoyed the hospitality of, of that time. And um, there was usually some of the family were here, Andrew and, and uh, Alexander in particular showed great promise as barman and uh, that, that was the role and uh, Di was on hand usually 
and, uh, and Marnie was there with us. So it was a great fam family event. And I look back on, on those, it was the highlight of, uh, of our year in December. It sort of kicked off Christmas. It was just fantastic. And uh, then when John started getting going and traveling overseas, then we would have um, people from overseas turn up there. We uh, two people that uh, particularly spring to mind: John Barnford from the, uh, who was president of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society, uh, and Gordon Appleby, who was the head of the law department. They were regular visitors. Gordon liked it so much here in Australia that he turned up every two years for about twenty years, and uh, we shared the accommodation. He stayed with us, and 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 he stayed with uh, with John and Ariel. And any of you who, who are in this room can look back and think about it. The amazing dinners, usually quite late at night after several bottles of, of wine, having great discussions and solving the world's problems. It was just absolutely fantastic. The other thing that I did, did that I, when I was thinking about this, so I remembered that I hijacked John um, to work as a facilitator for the Home Medicine Review Program when I was setting that up program in, in the early 2000s. And he was by far the oldest facilitator that I had, but he was one of the most successful up in the, in the North, uh, Northern Division that was based in Mount Judy, Judy. Yep. And uh, so John took to it like a duck to water and, and he was just fantastic with it. I often wondered where, where did John get his boundless energy from? He was, he was like that Duracell bunny in, uh, in the advertisement that just never stopped. Uh, it was just absolutely amazing. Or did, had he somehow rather worked out how to use high octane blood he was running on 95 or 98 rather than the normal thing there. He was just absolutely unbelievable. Nariel told me when we had a little discussion about it that she literally used to have to run to keep up with him, especially in airports. He'd be off, off in there and she'd look around and he'd be gone. So I eventually worked out that she was actually the person, she was the glue that made it all happen. She made it possible for John to fulfill all his ideas and dreams. And I, I suspect John was one of those people that probably had three good ideas before breakfast, and then Nabi would spend the rest of the day trying to talk him out of them. <laughs> At an age when everybody was slowing down, they would be both jetting off or cruising all over the world. And they went to Europe, uh, UK, Asia, the Pacific Islands. They attended a lot of conferences, meetings, and John was often invited to be the keynote speaker. So you made it happen, Ariel. We talked about the, uh, the olives, or Bill, Bill did there with it, and in the typical fashion of uh, John, when, when he decided that they were going to go olives, he went at it full whack. There was, he consulted uh, people about the variety of, of the olives, how to plant them, worked out how much water he needed, and on that beautiful spot, those of you who have had the privilege of being there, the house, looking out on the Goulburn River, river frontage of it, looking out across the vineyards, across the valley, and then all these olive trees that were there with it. And so any of you that have had the privilege of trying John's Mance Hill olive oil will know that the prizes that they won in 2009 and 10 for the champion at the uh, fine foods of the Royal Melbourne show was well deserved, it was fantastic. So what was John like as a man? He was kind and generous. He was a great communicator and he usually made friends. His passion was pharmacy. He was a great reader and a great thinker. And he was interested in all world affairs and finance. He could solve the whole world's problems if they'd let him. Being a clear thinker, 
He was able to see strategies to make his plans work. He loved nothing better than long conversations at the dinner table, late at night helped along by a glass or two of red wine. He was a devoted family man. His life was, uh, was dedicated to Nariel, his sister Marnie, uh, his sons Andrew and uh, Di and Ruth and the grandchildren. And Alexander, I, I know that you helped out on, you spent a lot of holidays at Seymour when he was growing up and, and even in the later years he travelled overseas and did some of the driving on the trips as well. So that was, that was great. And as has been outlined that um, in 2019, together with Nariel, he was respons responsible for the largest ever endowment to the pharmacy education field within Australia of a million dollars, which is a perpetual uh, John and Nariel Ware Fellowship in Pharmacy Education and Leadership. So I think by any standards, when I said to John, you got to put your money where your mouth is, he well and truly did. John's life work was one of, as one of the giants of pharmacy, both here and overseas, lives on with his achievements. John, we'll miss you. Vale, John Ware. Thank you, Mel. That's enough of the speaking from us. Um, we're lucky at the faculty that, um, as many of you would realise, we've um, used videos and documentaries for a whole range of different purposes. And John Palmer and his team have gone back through, what should we call them, the archives. And we've now got the chance to listen to some things from John that were pulled out from the archives. So, John. graduate from the old College of Pharmacy in Swanson Street, finished there, went to the United Kingdom, worked uh, University College Hospital in London for a short time, um, a pharmacy assistant working there is very well known, a lady called Agatha Christie. And I sometimes think it's rather great that I was able to tell people sometimes that I actually worked with Agatha Christie. It doesn't make me look too old, I hope. She was not a pharmacist. Uh, but she was actually a dispensary assistant trained under the British apothecary system and was working at University College Hospital in London. And uh, this is why in her, in her writing she knew so much about poisons. And I came back and uh, I said I'd like to join the Council of the Pharmaceutical Society. And uh, I was nominated and duly elected and strange enough the first country person or rural person ever elected to the to the council of the society. Mel Blatchford said to me afterwards, I thought you'd join the board if you want to be involved in education. And I said, Mel, the Pharmaceutical Society owns the college and that's where I want to go. So that's exactly where I went. And uh, fortunately in 1982 was, um, was uh, elected uh, to uh, join the college council. Uh, by 1987, I'd become the chair of the council and this year, and this, I guess, completes it. I'll have uh, completed just on 32 years of direct association of the college. Never at one stage, and that time I've been off one committee or the other along with this institution. Never been quite sure what I wanted to do. I was accepted to do law at Melbourne University. And uh, my father was a banker, uh, and um, I came home on, or I went to his office on this Friday afternoon to tell him 
that I'd been accepted to do law at Melbourne University. And uh, sitting in his office with him was the, his former best man, his mate, but he was married, a man called Charles McGimmon, who was the director of pharmacy at Royal Melbourne Hospital, um, and uh, another two pharmacists and a lawyer, and a surrogate uncle. And when I said I was going to do law, my surrogate uncle took to me and said, if you do law again, you won't be my surrogate nephew anymore. <laughs> and uh, so um, I then started, and, and the pharmacist said, Charles McGibbon said, think of doing pharmacy? I said, oh, no, I couldn't because I, I haven't done physics. And she said, I did chemistry. Well, he said, if you're interested, he said, why did you want to do law? And I just said, I wanted to interact and work with people. And um, he said, you'd do much better working with people in pharmacy. However, I wondered halfway through whether I wanted really to go into community pharmacy. So uh, for, I gave up pharmacy 12 months and for 12 months I actually flew um, uh, crayfish for three days a week backwards and forwards and got myself a commercial flying license doing it. <laughs> but then I, I went straight back and finished it and I no, never looked back ever since. I'm very glad with what I've what done. Many of my colleagues would laugh, I think I was probably a late maturer. <laughs> and, uh, and I think some families are like this. You never quite know what you want to, what you want to do sometimes. But most certainly I've, um, I'm finding it hard now I retired and uh, uh, then I find that uh, I missed everything too much, so I went back and started working with the National Prescribing Service. So <laughs> you don't, uh, I, it'd be very hard to say that I didn't develop a passion for pharmacy. I've always had an opinion that for pharmacy to go into Monash was a far better step than going into Melbourne. Melbourne medicine, particularly who would be associated with, has concentrated on medical specialties. Monash from day one was looking at community at, at community medicine very clearly and it was because the bulk of pharmacists practice in the community area this was a great opportunity for a great association to begin between the medical faculty at Monash and, and the faculty of pharmacy. I give enormous credit to Colin Chapman for taking a monodisciplinary institution into a very large organisation, in fact one well, of the largest university or the largest university in Australia I think. Not an easy task and then Bill Sharman coming along and stepping in and driving it forward again because what Bill has done is to take uh, the, the things that we were always highly regarded for in the old college and really push them up there into an international stage. The inspiration I think has come from the surrounds of being part of Monash and being encouraged within Monash to do these things rather than being made a little part of a very large medical family. I was invited to speak to a group of, of uh, 700 international pharmacists in Finland, in Helsinki, and I thought I'd have about uh, 100 odd people and someone stopped me on the way and said, you know, you've got over 700 in there already. And what I was doing was actually attacking the way that pharmacists were being taught. What became very obvious to me was that it was absolutely necessary for a pharmacist to be taught not only some of the, the, the newer clinical issues, but he must also or she must also have a very, very strong understanding of the background science to it. And if we look around Australia, the Victorian College of Pharmacy had the strongest scientific background of any of the schools in Australia. And what we needed to do was to take that science, teach the pharmacists the surrounding structures with it, but also teach them manners, manners and, and methods of communicating that information to the patient to, to get better outcomes. Our biggest challenge, perhaps, is not in the sciences, but in order to bring the practice of pharmacy into the modern world. Pharmacy needs to be recognised much more strongly, once again, as a provider of healthcare. A community pharmacy that's uh, featuring specials out on the street and, and, uh, and uh, uh, selling foodstuffs and issues like that, I think, 
doesn't invoke in the public's mind that this is a healthcare centre. Pharmacists need to understand, or in community pharmacy particularly, that they need to have the courage to charge for clinical services. Pharmacists, unfortunately, like most other people, don't like change. But there are new openings. I mean, uh, the whole opening relating to, um, to uh, DNA and genetic medicine. There are whole new areas of care, of patient care, that are open to pharmacy. That's where the future lies, because the pharmacist is truthfully uh, a specialist that is gonna, can enable the patient to have better outcomes from the use of their medicines. I think that there's a great opportunity for pharmacy and medicine to work together much closer. The sciences relating to medicine have increased so much that the, the medical practitioner's grasp of this is not as great as that of the pharmacists. And there's a great opportunity to work together in teamwork. In fact, the work, collaborative care has been raised as one of the major issues by the World Health Organization to get pharmacists, nurses, and physicians working together. We need to keep encouraging pharmacists to cross the borders and not just be allowed to be seen as suppliers of medicines, but get heavily involved in the clinical functions. I would hope at Monash that we are bringing our pharmacy students into contact with the medical students more frequently than has been able in the past. It was beautifully put together, John. And team. So Zoe's here. And as I was sitting there, I was actually thinking, I thought two things. First, Mel, the high octane stuff. It's got to be the olive oil. Boy, the price of that's gone up now. <laughs> and the things that John stood for, what he said, the guidances that he provided, the interest that he had, the ideas that he shared, the impacts that he had professionally, through family, through community, that didn't stop a few months ago. John's personal contributions of those obviously stopped a few months ago, but frankly, his impact through the profession and the other areas of his endeavour, we're still continuing that. As I sat there thinking in terms of the role that I had for a short period of time here at the college, I undertook some of his work on his behalf to fulfil his ideals. I'm sure Arthur's doing the same now. The staff are, the profession will be. And John's family will be somewhat emotional having seen all of that. But in fact, you're carrying on that legacy and that character and that energy, that enthusiasm. He just had a go at things. And my goodness, there's so much we can all learn from not just what he did, how he did it, and importantly, the way he did it. So, Thank you for being with us today here in the room and those on the live stream. We're pretty good at technology at Monash. The live stream bit, you miss out on the afternoon tea. Those in the room, um, the, the important part, and I know this was Nariel's desire, 
was that we could come together just as a group and we can um, share some fellowship, some stories, and those stories to make John proud. And in fact, for us to feel as a group connected back to him and indeed to each other because those connections are what makes a life important. Those connections are what John embodied with regard to the profession in this state and in this country and internationally. And importantly, for this college that became the faculty and then its role at Monash University. So thank you for being with us today. And uh, please join me at the back of the room up here for um, some COVID appropriate afternoon tea, whatever that is. So thank you for being here. We'll see you in the back in a moment.